<clears throat> yeah. I love it when you get riled up and show your crazy side. We're all nuts together. Hey, uh, so we're so glad you're here. We're jumping into a, a brand new series called Crushing Giants. And uh, I'm so excited about the next couple of weeks just looking at some amazing stories of God leading people past incredibly difficult and big obstacles. Uh, I'm so excited for this series. We're going to be in it for a couple weeks here together, and uh, I'm really looking forward to it. So would you join me in praying, and we'll get right into it. Dear God, we thank you for this morning and the opportunity we have to worship you together, and we come here from all different kinds of places, all different kinds of experiences, needing one thing, and that's that wonderful name of Jesus. We are not good at being the lords of our own lives. We can't do it without you. We agree together that we need you, that we need something bigger than ourselves, that we, we need the God of the universe to step into our lives and to change things. We pray this morning that you would be speaking to all of us. You know our hearts, you know our struggles, you know our fears, you know all that it is that wells up inside of us and you know exactly what we need. So we pray that your spirit would just move in this place, that we would all see Jesus, that we would all hear your words and not mine, and that, that you would change us to be more like Jesus. In Jesus' name, amen. You ever have a feeling that something bigger was just waiting? Or maybe that it wasn't waiting, but that you just had this sense of urgency that that that's something bigger, that you were made for something bigger, that you were tapped for something more amazing than just what is now. I think inside all of us from time to time, there's often a drive, a, a kind of a sense that we were created for something more, for something bigger, for a purpose and for meaning, and oftentimes we get struggle, we struggle in the waiting to discover what that is. The, we struggle in the waiting of realizing our purpose and our meaning, and, and we get stuck in the moments where we're not seeing what we feel is, should be happening. We're not seeing what, what we feel could be next. We're not sensing our purpose, but we just know it's there waiting, and we hope something big and something better and something more meaningful is laying in wait for us, but it's easy to lose track of it in the waiting. Do you know that you are created for a purpose and that your purpose is given to you by a God who has a future for you that is far better and far bigger than you ever could have imagined? It's better than a future you ever could have wrote for yourself. God has a plan and purpose for all of us, for each of you, no matter who you are, no matter what your life has looked like, no matter how bad you've messed things up. In Jeremiah, it says this in verse 29, 11, for I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord. Plans to prosper you and not to harm you. Plans to give you a hope and a future. And then Ephesians 3, it reminds us that this God, that this God who gives us this plan, who has this purpose for our lives, who's drawing us to this future he has laid out for us is more than capable of doing more than you ever could have asked or imagine so that he could be glorified in your life and in your future. You see, we hear things like that. It instills a sense of purpose and meaning and a calling to something bigger and better than we could have imagined. And yet here we are, grinding it out in the waiting, waiting for something, waiting for a sign, waiting to realize our purpose and we get lost while we're waiting. And when we get lost, big questions roll into our minds like, was it, was it true? Is it, is it really true that God has a purpose for me? Is it really true that he, has, he adds meaning to every area of my life? Does he want to use me to make an impact in the lives of others? Is he, does he love me the way he says he loves? And while we're waiting to see the change, those questions seep in. It reminds me of when I got married 15 years ago. I got married really young. So I'm still really young. So don't try to, don't try to date me 
because I said 15 years ago, I look old for my age, all right? 15 years ago, I was marrying this wonderful, amazing woman, and the, the dream for my future was just so close. It was, it was right there. The big thing that would, because clearly I'm not good at this thing all by myself, right? Like the, the big thing that was ready to change in this moment when this woman and I were going to vow together before God to covenant in relationship, to, to give selflessly our hearts to each other in this ceremony, and we're, I was so excited because everything was going to change. She clearly makes me better in every aspect of my life, even when I'm, even my clothes, which this morning she didn't wake up in time to help me with. <laughs> Something big, a promise of a different future, but in the waiting, all kinds of questions can creep in, and the person who was supposed to tell them to come down from the third story room in the Yingling Mansion, why they stuck them all the way up there to get ready, I have no idea, forgot to tell them that it was time to come down into the garden for the wedding ceremony, and so there we were, all these groomsmen lined up, me with this innocent little smile on my face, waiting for the love of my life to march down that aisle, and then she didn't come. And the keyboardists, you know what keyboardists do in this time? They're like, oh, somebody didn't get the cues, so I'm going to hit the keys harder. Ding! You know, like the keyboardist is like breaking knuckles on the piano because they're, they're still not coming down. And, and I'm not exaggerating this. Like we watched it. I'm like, man, that felt like an eternity. And we were like, let's rewind the tape. Oh, yeah, it's an eternity. It's a whole eternity up there. I'm like wondering, what are we doing? My groomsmen are like, man, this is hysterical. Josh just got stood up at the altar. I look at my buddy who's doing the wedding. I'm like, so what do we do if she doesn't ch- show up? Like, I'm pretty sure she like figured it out and said, you know what? Let's just think about this for a little. I haven't thought this whole Josh life thing through. Maybe I need to, to plan. Or am I sure? And I'm, I'm like, what do we do? And he's like, well, do you have the tickets or does she have the tickets to Barbados? Let's... <laughs> Because you and I, we could just go to Barbados. And I'm thinking, I, don't, I had things planned for Barbados that I don't want to do with you. Like, I have, I have big dreams for Barbados. I don't want to go with you, Neil. I want to go with my wife. Will somebody please go figure out what's going on? My father sneaks up. Here it was, you know, my aunt. I'll throw her under the bus because she deserves it. Who was supposed to let the ladies know it was time to come down. Just didn't do it. But in the waiting... In the waiting, all the questions start to swirl around in your head. The fears accentuate in the waiting. The the doubts creep in, even if you don't want them to. And the plans you have seem, well, they seem like they're never going to happen in the waiting. And, And sometimes it can feel like that. It can feel like we hear about this promise from God. We hear about this meaning he wants to add in our lives, but things don't change right away. And we go through life day to day, day to day, day to day, and we're waiting for God to show up. We're waiting for something big to happen. We're waiting for lives to change. We're waiting for our life to change. We're waiting for our relationships to change. God, why aren't you doing something now? Why aren't things different right now? I thought you loved me. I thought you had a future for me. It says you have a promise for me, that, that you could do more than I can imagine, but I can imagine way more than what's going on right now in my life. And the questions, they just swirl around in the waiting. But God is in the waiting. And we don't see Him because we're looking for something big and life altering and something drastic. But He's with you in the waiting. He's got a purpose for the waiting, and he will use you in the waiting, and he will do some things that you can't see in the waiting. So if you have been waiting for something, waiting for something to change, waiting for a relationship to get better, waiting for something bigger, a moment you feel is just out of reach, know this, that God is with you in the waiting. You know, David was tapped, and we're going to be looking at 1 Samuel chapter 16, the end of it, in chapter 17. We're going to take two weeks to break up this incredibly epic story about David and Goliath. If you haven't heard this story, it's about a giant. 
It's about a real big giant that stood in the path of the destiny that God had tapped David for, the destiny he had been anointed for. And God has a destiny for you that's far bigger and far better, but it seems like all the time on our journey, there are always obstacles. Let's call them giants. There are always giants that pop up and seem to oppose and frustrate us. And this story is a story about David. And to really understand it, we have to go back into chapter 16. You see, David was just some farm kid tending sheep out in the field. He was a young man, probably a teenager. All his brothers were gathered together because this guy Samuel, the prophet of God, had been instructed by God that he was going to call, tap the next king of Israel from Jesse, this guy named Jesse's family. So Jesse gathered all of the, the big brothers, all the powerful brothers, all of the, the brothers he would expect to be king, and they, they left David out in the field to take care of the sheep, and Samuel's going through, and surely, God, this is the one. No, that's not the one. Surely, this is the one. No, that's not the one. And finally, all options exhausted, Samuel says, is there anybody else? Well, yeah, there's this guy, David, but you won't pick him. He's just a kid. He's just tending some sheep out in the field. They called David down, and, and, and Samuel sees David, and he's like, this is the anointed one. This is the one God wants me to anoint. This is the next king. There is something big and epic for this guy here. This, his purpose is amazing. This is the next king of Israel. He anoints David, and do you know what David does? He goes back to tending sheep. He's back in the field, in the muck, in the grime, in the dew of the morning, and everybody knows how awful it is when your sneakers and socks get wet in the dew of the morning. Come on. He's just hitting the grind again. I wonder if David's a lot like people when sometimes they come to church and they're searching and they're wondering if God has more and they come to church and sing incredible songs about this incredible God and, and we hear inspiring messages, hopefully. I'm being generous to myself. You could, you could help with that too. And, and then we get all fired up about this promise, but then we go back to the grind and our socks are wet with the dew of life. And we wonder, where is the promise and where is the purpose? If you're just going from good feeling to good feeling, you're missing it all. There, there's so much that God has for you in between. So David, he's back at the field and he just goes back to faithfully doing what he did before. I wonder if the questions rolled in. We don't know if the questions rolled in, but I wonder if the questions rolled in like, huh, that king thing was cool for about five minutes. I don't know why they had to pour oil on my head. It's been a week and I still can't get that stuff out. Like, I, 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 sounds like a great idea. You know, what's going to happen? Is, is like, God, can I like send me a sign? Is somebody going to show up with some paperwork I have to sign? Like, what's going to happen? But David in the waiting is just faithful. It's crazy. So while David's tending sheep, God was still working even though he couldn't see it. And you're going through life and you're wondering, where is God? I don't see him. I don't. Just because you don't see him doesn't mean he's not working in you, through you, and listen, on your behalf. So he's in the field, and God was doing some stuff that he had no idea. He's in, he's in the field, in waiting, and God was working. And, and an evil spirit comes and torments King Saul. And his, Saul was the standing king of Israel, and he's tormented. And he, his servant suggests this. He comes in verse 15. It says, his attendant said, this evil spirit from God is tormenting you. Let our Lord command his servants here. Search for someone who can play the lyre. He'll play, and when he, the evil spirit of God comes on you, you'll, you'll feel better. The lyre, right? It's like a little mini, it's like a micro, it's like a mini harp. It's like Cupid's harp. You know what Cupid's harp is? It's like this little, it's this little weird instrument. It's funny looking. It's got a little like thing. It's like this big. You know, maybe not that song. Maybe a different song. It's okay. In the last service, I did the, never mind. It's just, yeah. Just watch the tape. It was worse than that one. Like, it's just playing this little lie, right? Like, let's go find somebody that... 
anybody, I think, the, I think the cure here is this little weird instrument. Like, let's just go find somebody that can play that little weird instrument that you like so much, and we'll bring that in, and it'll be all good, right? And, again, and, and Saul's like, yeah, that's a great idea. Let's find somebody with the little weird harp, and we'll bring them in. That'll make me feel better. And then one of his servants answered, and listen to this in verse 18. Don't miss verse 18 of six, chapter 16. One of his servants answered, I have seen, I've seen somebody. I've noticed something about somebody. Listen, it says, I have seen a son of Jesse of Bethlehem who knows how to play the lyre. He knows how to play that funny-looking harp. He's brave. He's a brave man and a warrior. He speaks well. He's fine-looking, and the Lord is with him. You see, in the waiting, David was just being faithful to use the gift that God had given him. He was just being faithful to to be a man of character even when nothing seemed like it was breaking the right way for him. And, And he was just pursuing God and his relationship with him so that even in the waiting, he was noticed. Like, you want to get noticed some... You're waiting... You're waiting for something to happen, as something to change. What if it just starts with you, right where you're at, using the gifts you've been given? What if it, what if it, and, and you've been given gifts. Listen, the Bible is clear when it talks about how, our, how the church is supposed to function, how the family of God, how the children of God are supposed to function together. It says this, it says, you all have been gifted according to God's grace. Come on, you all have a gift. You may not see it. You may think you stink at everything. You may think you're not good at something, but I guarantee you, you're a child of God. He has gifted you with something, and that something, I need it. I need it. See, it's not just about having the gift of being able to speak in front of people that's important. It's, that's, no more, that's no more important than the gift you bring to the table and you brought to the room today. And if you don't know what your giftedness is, know this, that when the Bible talks about how this all works together, it says you have a gift and 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 you have a gift, all to bring God glory in how you live your life and to impact other people. That great purpose that God has for you. It's not laying in wait. He's already given you the gift that'll draw you to your purpose. But you gotta, you gotta embrace it and then use it. Even if you don't know what God's gonna do with it. Even if you don't see the plan. Even if you don't see the picture. Even if you're questioning whether there's a purpose. Even in the waiting, start using your gift. We need it. Your friends need it. David was in the waiting and he was using his gift of playing this funny little instrument. This funny little instrument that would springboard a massive step in the path that God was taking him on. Not only was he using his gift, but he was, his character was intact. You know, you know what happens when we're waiting for something to change, when, we're wait, waiting for, when, I'm, when I'm waiting for something big to happen, you know what happens? I, I think, man, well, what's going on with God? Did I do something wrong? Is God mad at me? Is the prom- did I mess up the promise? Is the plan not legit? Like, maybe I imagined this whole thing. And so I, in the waiting, I start to ask questions. But you know what those questions lead me to? My character starts to break because my questions are throwing the, the design God has for me into doubt. And sometimes it's an easy step to start trying to skip your way ahead, to maybe cut in line a little bit, maybe just cheat just a little bit, just, tr- just cut the corner just a hair, trying to force the, the promise and the plan you hope for instead of just being patient and letting God develop your character so that he can make you into the person you need to be for the future he has for you. You know, in the waiting, David's character was intact so that some dude heard him playing a little and said, man, that guy, he can play that, but he's a solid dude too. He's brave. And and then the third thing is, he noticed his relationship with God. Not only is he brave, not only is he using his gift, 
But man, God's got a special, a special place in his life. And, and he notices that the Lord was with him. You may not know what to do. Just start using your gift. You may not know how to act. Focus on your character being intact, even when nobody's watching, even when the circumstances are not breaking in your favor. And third, focus on just honing in on your relationship with God. Cut out all the distractions that come in the waiting and make your relationship with God a priority. It springboards this whole journey for David as he's stepping into the direction that God has for him, and everything starts to break. It goes from the field to the court of the king, the court of the king where one day he would sit. I wonder what his imagination said, right? Oh, that, that thing where they dumped the oil on my head, maybe it's legit. Like all of a sudden, I'm playing, I, I didn't think I'd be in here playing this thing, but here I am. I'm in the court of the king. Maybe God is for real. Maybe this is going to happen. Like, I wonder if as he stepped into that moment, the trust was just building and the confidence was just building. But every time things start to go in the right direction, it always seems like something goes wrong. Can I get an amen from somebody all up in the place? Like, I know that sounds churchy, but for real, every time I take a step in the right direction, it feels like somebody's pushing me three steps back. Every time it seems like you get that job promotion, all of a sudden four more bills that you didn't know existed showed up and Verizon changed their data plan or something, you know, and every time it feels like you have... Your health is finally where it goes. That doctor just says something that you didn't expect to hear. Every time it feels like you're paying off your house and catching up, the car breaks down. It always feels like every time you take some steps in the right direction and you're starting to realize on a deeper level the, God, the purpose God has for your life, an obstacle always jumps up. And in this case, it was a giant. It was a big giant with a humongous head. <laughs> I'm not kidding. It was like nine foot, nine, nine foot, nine inches tall or something like that. You know the size of a head that sits on a man <laughs> that big? Like I can't find a fitted hat to fit my head. And I'm six if you stretch me really hard. Six foot. Like the Bible says that this guy was huge. In fact, the spear, uh, the, the head of his spear was 15 pounds. That's like more than some of you people. That's more than like, okay, it's not more than you bench. I'm sure you all bench more than 15 pounds. Like 15 pounds spearhead. This guy was a, just a beast of a man. His name was Goliath. It says that he would, the Philistines, they see, they were at war with the Israelites and they would line up their armies against each other and they would come out on the, you know, the morning, they'd like drink their tea or whatever, that somebody would get on the horn and then they would go out and they would line up against each other in opposition and the Philistine armies on one side and the Israelites on the other side. And every day, this giant, is, he was a champion named Goliath. He was from Gath and he, would, he came out of the Philistines' camp. He was huge. Nine foot tall, nine inches. He had a bronze helmet on his huge noggin. <clears throat> Spear weighed 15 pounds. Goliath stood and he shouted to the ranks of Israel, Why do you come out and line up for battle? Am I not a Philistine? And are you not servants of Saul? Choose a man and have him come down to me. If he is able to fight and kill me, we will become your subjects, but if I overcome him and kill him, you will become our subjects and serve us. Then the Philistine said, this day I defy the armies of Israel. <clears throat> Give me a man and let us fight each other. On hearing the Philistines' words, Saul and the Israelites were dismayed and terrified. And isn't that our response when the obstacles jump up? dismayed or scared to death. The obstacle comes up and pops into our life and we're like, whoa, 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 this is dismaying. I know you all use that word all the time. <laughs> Honey, I'm so dismayed right now. <laughs> I don't know, big words, you know, I'm working on the kids' vocabulary with them. Dismayed, we get so defeated before there's even a fight. 
It's just the popping up of the obstacle pushes us into a place where we are backing away from the path God is leading us down. You know, as Goliath stands there, the obstacle in our way, and all of the people, all of the army, these brave men, dismayed and terrified. And every day he would pop out. Every day he would pop out. Forty days in a row until David shows up on the scene, he would pop out and he would hurl these threats against God and against their nation. And he would call them names and he would tell them lies. And isn't that what giants do in our life? They always lie to you. So I don't know what giant you face. Maybe your giant is a health issue. Maybe it's a relationship issue. Maybe it's a financial issue. Maybe it's an inner turmoil that you wrestle with. I don't know what giant is lying in front of you, but I know this. It'll always lie to you, and it'll tell you things. Like, you're not good enough. Like, man, you're not worth it. You think something big is waiting for you? Nothing big is waiting for you. You can barely handle what you have now. You think something meaningful is going to happen to your life? Nothing meaningful is going to happen to your life. You think God is there for you? God's not there for you. Nothing is going to help you get through this obstacle. You're all by yourself. You're all alone. And the giants in our lives, whatever they may be, they always lie to you. Never mind the fact that God said you're worth everything. You want to know how much you're worth? Here's my son on the cross bleeding for you. I've given you a purpose. Never mind that the whole book is full of God's purpose and direction, meaning for our lives. He he says, I give you a purpose. You see, the giant hasn't changed me. The giant hasn't changed God. He's the same yesterday as he is today, as he will be tomorrow. And his promises for you are true. Who are you going to listen to? The giants that lie to you about who you are, that push you down, that defeat you, that make you, that, that cause fear to well up in your heart, the giants that make you feel meaningless or worthless or like a failure, who are you going to believe are the God that says you're worth so much. I have a plan for you. I can do something bigger than you could imagine. Just trust me and follow me, even when you don't see it. You see, when your filter is what others say about you, the possible always seems impossible. But when your filter is God, the, the impossible becomes possible. It was Jesus who said it. He said, with man, this is impossible, but with God, all things are possible. You see, you start listening to the giant, and it'll make even the possible things in your relationships, in your workplace, in your marriage, in your friendships, and in your singleness, it'll make even the possible things that lie in wait for you, even the little steps that are possible, if you listen to the giants, it'll always make it seem like every next step is impossible and that you're not going to get anywhere in life. But if you listen to God, the impossible becomes possible if you'll just trust and follow even when you don't see it. So who are you going to listen to? The giants who seem big, who scare you, who, or are you going to listen to God who is always bigger than the giants you'll face? doesn't matter what giant. I know you got big giants. I know you got really big giants, but God is bigger and he is better and he has more for you just past the giant. See, the biggest thing about crushing giants that we have to understand is it's really not about you crushing the giants. It's not about a seven-step series or learn how to wield the sword this way or play a liar this way. It's not about what you can do. You see, crushing the giants in life is about following God as he crushes the giants in front of you. It's about a confidence in him, a trust in him that wells up in your spirit the courage to step past your fears as he takes you past the biggest obstacles in your life. You want to follow his plan for you. You just got to follow him and trust him when the giants seem really scary and throw the lies in your face. 
Forty days, the lies spilled out, and then David showed up. It's incredible to see what got him there, cheese plate. Spoiler alert, didn't see that coming, did you? David's at home going back and forth between Saul and the field, Saul and the field, Saul and the field, Saul and the field, which is exhausting in itself. It's like going from work to soccer practice, work to soccer practice, work to soccer practice, work to soccer practice, work to... It's like your life with kids, right? It's exhausting, and, and here in the middle of it, his dad says, hey, David, come here. I have some stuff I want you to take to your brothers. Here's some loaves of bread. Here's some grains. Here's some stuff. I want to make sure they're well fed. I also am really worried about them. I want to know if they're okay. So you're going to take this. Oh, and here, by the way, here's 10 cheeses, you know. Here's, we got some Gouda in here. We got some goat cheese. I know nobody likes goat cheese, but we got it. You know, and there's some cheddar, some with jalapeno, some without. Here's a cheese tray. Take it to the leaders of the army, and, and as a sign of my respect, respect and favor towards them. So take it. And so David goes on this mission where he carries a cheese tray. You know what this is like. You can't. Why is it that we always take cheese trays? You, what do you bring to a party? Bring a, huh, what, what will block everybody up for the next three days? How can we simultaneously destroy every diet at this party in one fell swoop? You know the lactose intolerant people can't resist it. We take cheese trays everywhere we go. It seems like the routine can just be the routine. But what if God can even use the cheese plate that you show up to a party with to help move you along in his path and plan to realize your potential in him, to realize your purpose in him? God can even use the cheese tray. David goes up to the front lines, and they're on the front lines. As he arrives, the horns are blowing. It's time to line up in their battle positions. He sees this. He panics. He gives the cheese tray in the care of somebody else, and he runs up to the front line to find his brothers and to see what's okay. He gets up to the front line, and there's Goliath stepping out again, throwing lies. But David's filter wasn't the giant that stood out there. The, the filter for David was this God. His approach, his approach to the challenges in life weren't, weren't dictated by the challenges. His approach to the challenges of life were dictated by God. His, his approach to his financial crisis would have been dictated by God. His approach to his failing health would have been dictated by his view of God. His approach to his Marriage falling apart would have been dictated by his view of God. You see, David's view, his filter was God and what God said, because what God says is always bigger than the giants. He shows up to the front lines, and here it would be that everything changes. He's going around and he's asking, What do you guys hear this? Why is nobody, why are you guys just waiting? Is everybody just sitting here? What are you waiting for? How can you listen to these lies? How, how could you? Listen, stop waiting. Don't listen to the lies. Step out and use whatever gift you have, wherever you are, even if your circumstances are terrible. Just step out and use your gift. And as he's going around, he gets dressed down by his brother. And, and as he's going around, people overheard, and they report to Saul, it says in verse 31, and Saul sent for him, and David said to Saul, let no one lose heart. For 40 days, the entire world on this front line revolving around this giant has been losing heart. Some of you have been losing heart at your circumstances for a lot longer than 40 days. It's exhausting. You don't have to lose heart about the giants in your life. You just have to trust God that he'll see you through. He's, he says, let no one lose heart on account of this Philistine. I'll go fight him. Saul says, you're not able to go out against this Philistine and fight him. You're only a young man, and he's been a warrior from his youth. But David said, your servant has been keeping his father's sheep in the sheep field. God was getting ready a king to crush a giant. And what if right now God is getting you ready in your field? Maybe it's a sheep field. Maybe it's not. What if right now in your field God is getting you ready to crush a giant? He says, a lion came and a bear came and carried off the sheep from the flock and I went after it. <laughs> I struck it. It looks a little, the liar player looks a little different right now, doesn't he? I struck it. 
When it turned on me, I seized it by its hair. I struck it and I killed it. Your servant has killed both the lion and the bear. This Philistine will be like one of them because he has defied the armies of the living God. The Lord who rescued me from the paw of the lion and the paw of the bear will rescue me from the hand of this guy. And Saul says, go and the Lord be with you. It's a convincing speech from David. Because his filter was God. His strength was sourced from God. And because God repurposed a past in a sheep field for his glory on the battlefield. Listen, whatever your past is, maybe you've wrestled the bear. Some of you look like you could have. <laughs> you still with me? Maybe you've been fighting some giants. Maybe it's been a lion that you had to grab by the hair. Maybe you didn't come out all that well. Maybe it bruised you. Maybe your past beat you up. Maybe it beat you down. Maybe you've been listening to the giants for way too long. Maybe it's been way over 40 days where you have been disheartened. Whatever junk you have in your past, God will repurpose it. You see, he'll repurpose it to help you overcome whatever's next. Just allow God three things. Allow God to repurpose your past. That only starts by stepping into faith in Jesus through what he's done for you on the cross. You see, it's about giving God your past and saying, I've sinned against you, God. I'm sorry. Would you forgive me? Through the blood of Jesus on the cross, I believe that you sent Jesus to pay for my sins and die on a cross in my place. And I give you my life. Would you make me new? And God will repurpose your past to help you overcome what's next. Don't be, don't be shaken by the lies anymore. They'll come at you from all different kinds of angles, from unexpected places, through unexpected people, but you have to stop believing the lies and start believing God more. What he says about you is true. What they say about you is not. And third, just start using your gift right now now in the sheep field. Let's pray. Dear God, thank you so much for loving us. We thank you that we don't have to conquer giants alone, but that you will conquer giants for you if we just follow, for us, if we just follow you. God, we want to, we, we face some big stuff. It can be frustrating in the waiting. So many questions come in, but in the waiting, would you help us to focus on a relationship with you? Help us to use our gifts right where we're at. Help us to be people of character, even when we don't see the plan. And most importantly, help us to believe you over so many other voices that tell us so many lies about who we are. We're anxiously awaiting, God. But while we wait, we know that we are waiting with you and that you are moving before us and behind us and on behalf of us to help us step into the future you have for us. Thank you for the cross. Without that, none of this is possible. In Jesus' name, amen.